Okay, so Pancake Day, technically known as Shrove Tuesday, represents the day before Ash Wednesday. I know, confusing. But Ash Wednesday represents the first day of what's called Lent. And Lent represents 40 days. The 40 days that Jesus went into the wilderness and fasted. So Shrove Tuesday, what's the relationship with pancakes? Well, because people would be fasting from the Wednesday, uh, and when you think 40 days is actually a very long time, back then they didn't have fridges, and even if they did, things like eggs and things wouldn't keep. So even like for myself, who's about to go away on a short trip, I'll make sure that there's nothing in the fridge, so I'll use up what's available. And that's what Shrove Tuesday represents. It's the day before, so it's kind of almost binge day, but what you would have had in your house back then, you'd have had some fat and some flour and some eggs and other things as well. So typically I'm assuming pancakes or, or similar kind of breads would have then been had with other foods that were available at the time. But over time this has developed into simply making pancakes to celebrate that day in reflection of giving something up for Lent. So we'll come on to that shortly. Now this came after his baptism, but when he was in the wilderness fasting, this was when he was tempted by the devil, when Satan came against him. So let's have a look at what happened. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You know, when I listen to that story, I think about the interesting twist of what Satan was doing there. So apart from the obvious, where he was throwing scripture at Jesus and Jesus was able to rebuke him, I've observed some fascinating things, especially with my background involved in coaching and then knowing a little bit of psychology. Because in actual fact, if you look at what Satan did, he played with the whole mind-body-spirit dynamic. So let me expand on that. He told him, a person who'd been fasting, to turn a rock into bread. Now, of course, he'd have been craving bread. Now, to me, this is the whole mind aspect, because when we think of the mind, the mind is kind of like a, a big computer. It takes in information, sensory information through your five senses, and it processes that. It helps us to function in the world, so things like pain draw our attention to things. But at the same time, there's certain functions, executive functions that we need, such as breathing, drinking water, eating food, even sex for reproduction. So when you actually think about it, a lot of the devil's playground of the mind is purely on what the body craves. But that's the point. The mind is a kind of function in itself. The mind does not represent who we are. It's a bit like switching on your computer and, and typing things into Google. There's so much information and knowledge out there, but that doesn't represent you as a person. That's not your identity as a person. So either way, the point is that the first temptation that the devil threw at Jesus was about the mind. Would he crack? Would he break and give in to his cravings for bread? And he didn't. 
The next challenge that the devil gave to Jesus was actually about the body. Throw yourself down. Now actually the one about the body is even more interesting because if you look at it, it's kind of playing to the concept of fear. Even though the devil was sort of tempting him to throw himself off to prove that he wouldn't be broken, the, Jesus clearly rebuked him with the word and it wasn't even a concept that he needed to even entertain. But the point is, it was still about the body. So the devil was throwing fear, the fear of throwing yourself off a cliff, the, th the fear of breaking the bones, breaking the flesh. But I still see that in the world today, that when we look at what Satan does with regards to the body, it's a fear, a fear of health, a fear of damage to the body. But also the opposite is true, building it up. If you take certain supplements, you will be better. Constantly playing with the mind over concepts of the body. Even identity, people look in the mirror and often don't like what they see, but the people around them, they don't see what you see. They see you as a person for who you are in the spirit, the kind of person you are, your nature, and I mean your spiritual nature, whether you're giving in kind or whether you're not. These are the aspects and attributes most people see in a person, not just the physical. But again, I've used the analogy before of a car. A car is a very good example. When you buy a brand new car, most people kind of don't want to go to certain places because they don't, they don't want to scratch it, they don't want to get mud on it, or the opposite's true, they get a brand new car and they spend all their time polishing it and treating it and, and looking after it in a way that's, you know, it's kind of obsessive. But that's the body, the car, the outer shell, is where again the devil went to next. So we've covered mind and body. But then we move to spirit. Because in the final temptation, it was the ego. Now some people think of ego because of psychology is all to do with the mind. But as I said, if you think about a car again, an engine management system takes care of all the detail of how the engine functions. And of course, we're now moving into a time where integrated computers will drive your cars, not just AI. So if you think of that from that point of view, the mind represents this ability for the car to drive itself. Then what's your role as the driver? Or are you just the passenger? If you are the driver, then aren't you the one deciding where to take the car? Aren't you the one deciding whether you go on a fast journey or a slow journey? Aren't you the one who's deciding the purpose of the journey? The reason to take out the car? It should never be the car takes us out. But I do hear that at times. I hear people saying, I must take the car out because if I don't, the engine will get damaged or I must run the car in. Which to be fair, you sometimes have to because it's mechanical, but we're not. So let's come back to that third temptation. The third temptation of ego. He promised him things. He promised him exaltation to make him special. Fame, power and fortune. Now you see, these are things that are not coming from the flesh. These are desires and these desires come in the spirit. Now, of course, Jesus rebukes that because again, unlike mind, body, spirit, Jesus and scripture refers to spirit, soul and body. Satan's playground is the mind, but Jesus overcame that. And as Christians, I think that's one of the superpowers and the best tools for the job is receiving the Holy Spirit, which is where the old man, the old person, that old spirit that I'm referring to, disappears. The new man comes forward and that new man with the Holy Spirit is then combined with the word of scripture, the word of God. When you put the two together, the mind-body-spirit principles that Satan uses no longer have power in our lives. The more we focus on our Holy Spirit and following the Spirit with the Word, the more successful we will be in life. Now for Lent, giving up things. Someone suggested to me, you know, is it simply good to fast? And based on what we've just discussed, my advice is, mm, we have to give up things that are relevant. Now, I think from what I understand of what's going off in the world today, the devil plays more so in the mind and especially within the body. The fear of illness, death, the fact that we may lose our vision, we may develop disease. We constantly are being told that we need the health service and then at the same time we're denied that service and that's building up anxiety and fear in people and I've witnessed this out and about. So my challenge to you for this then is probably 
stop buying the newspapers stop watching mainstream media and if you really want to go all out why not give up your TV license and switch off the TV and to be honest with that money you could do a lot more for yourself you could find more productive things to do in that time your leisure time can become productive time but remember that's for the extremists out there those who really want to push it but my challenge to you is to realize these are the three places that the devil tries to work in our lives I want you to go away and actually think about the things that challenge you in life, the things that you have fears over, and see if they fit into any of them three categories. Please feel free to leave comments below. Don't forget also to leave comments of what you are going to give up for Lent. And also, don't forget, if you make my amazing pancakes, please tell us what fillings you're going to use. So for now, may God's grace be with you. blessed by this video why not give it a like also subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of future videos